Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to uh, join you here to describe the Model International Mobility Convention. I need to start off with two quick apologies. One, just having heard such an inspiring talk, discussion about climate change, I need to apologize for cutting down some trees to give you the handout that's in front of you. <laughs> I'm, the reason I do so is that I'm hoping that you'll take it with you as you head back to your homes tonight look over it, uh, follow the link at the bottom of page two, and if the model convention strikes you as worthwhile, you will join others in signing it. So that's why I passed that out. Uh, the second apology is for my voice. Uh, as of last night, there was no voice whatsoever with laryngitis. There's been a significant improvement, and I think I have 19 minutes and 53 seconds uh, worth of voice to share with you. I'd like to begin with uh, two uh, demographic uh, snapshots, and then describe six elements, six parts of this Model International Mobility Convention, designed to provide a global floor set of protect protections uh, for migration, refugees, and others, uh, that I hope will tempt you to look into it further and join others in signing. But first of all, the two snapshots, migration, there are about 258 million migrants today in the world by the UN definition of someone who's living in a jurisdiction not their own for at least a year. Uh, that's roughly the population somewhere in between Brazil and Indonesia, so it's a significant number of people. They contribute immensely to global prosperity and cultural diversity. And yet at the same time, we know in some countries, including our own, we have parts of our citizenry who are nervous that we've lost control of our borders. Equally importantly, maybe even more so, many of these migrants are undocumented and don't have full legal protections in the new lives they're attempting to create. But important as migration is, equally important are the one and a half billion visits that take place every year. People moving across borders, as some of our international members will have just done visiting us today, uh, making for a notion of global mobility and globalization in human terms that's incredibly important. My second snapshot is refugees. Uh, there are about 25 million UNHCR recognized refugees, 3 million more people seeking to get refugee status, many others who have temporary protection without the full legal protections embodied in the 1951 convention. They are getting saved by having crossed a border. But the circumstances they're in are very challenging. The typical displacement lasts about 20 years. It's not a short term. Uh, more than half of the refugees in, this, in the world are under 18. So there's a big question. Will they get that vital early education that allows them to create the kind of lives that they want? And 85% of the world's refugees are being taken care of, not in Germany, Sweden, or the US, or any of the other headline countries that we read about, but in the developing world. And they are paying for supporting a global responsibility to care for refugees. So those are some of the challenges. In this model international mobility convention that you have summarized in front of you, I'd like to mention six features that make it special. Uh, this was put together by a commission whose members you see listed right there, including uh, eminent scholars of migration, refugee law, migration law, sociologists, economists, political scientists, and others. I was the convener of that group, hardly the eminent expert in it, but the convener. We met for a year and a half and developed that convention that I'd like you to take a look at. The first point I'd draw your attention to this convention is both uh, comprehensive and cumulative, unlike the rest of the international law that governs migration and refugees. It's comprehensive in that it covers the movement of people across borders, mobility, soup to nuts. Everything from a visitor, through a tourist, through a foreign student, through a labor migrant, an investor, and then a forced migrant and a refugee. And the idea is that it's also cumulative. That is, we need an increasing set of rights as we move across these different statuses. Uh, 
If you're a visitor, if, if you or I were to go to, to Berlin or London or Mexico City or Mumbai, we only need a few rights. We need our basic freedom of thought. Uh, we need uh, uh, emergency medical care. If we happen to get run over by a bus, we shouldn't just be left to bleed in the streets because we're not a national. And we need reasonable access to the courts so that if we rent a car or a motorbike and run over somebody, we'll have it properly adjudicated. We don't necessarily have a right to a job. We certainly don't have a right to vote. As you move across the statuses, you need other rights. If you're a tourist, you need to have your contracts honored. If you're a student, you need equal access in a university and a transcript. If you're a labor migrant, you need equal pay for equal work compared to nationals. If you're an investor, you need clarity on the terms of the return of your investment. And if you're a forced migrant or refugee, you need something much more. You need the whole panoply of rights that have been denied to you at home that have forced you to flee your country to save your life. So we see the rights expand with these different statuses. The idea, basically, is that everyone should have all of their human rights met somewhere, but no one has a, has a right to claim all of their rights everywhere. That's the logic underlying this provision. Let me mention two expansions of rights that are quite important to us that are embodied in this model convention. The first has to do with temporary migration, or what's called circular migration. A temporary migrant worker is somebody who is resident in a jurisdiction, not their own, for a set period of time, is not on a green card or a long-term uh, visa. The view of the commission discussed this is that the temporary migrants have both too few and too many rights under the existing legal framework for migrant workers, the Migrant Workers Convention of 1990. This convention is designed to provide protection for migrant workers in countries of destination, but no major country of destination has ratified this treaty. It means it's not doing its work. That is, nothing, no one in North America or Europe, Japan, or anywhere else. And as a result, workers, therefore, are without a floor level of protection at the global level. What we propose is to improve the treaty and make it, make it one that is attractive to countries both that are sending workers and receiving them. And we want to expand the notion of temporary work so that we have fewer benefits provided. The Migrant Workers Convention provides social housing and all sorts of benefits, even to temporary workers, which may have deterred its ratification by countries of destination. Uh, and that's a problem. And it also has too few protections for temporary migrant works, workers. They need multiple visas, for example, a temporary worker, so that they can maintain links with family who may have stayed at home. This is an idea that we borrowed from a friend, Doug Massey, who's maybe in the back of the room. They also need to have portable pensions. If you earn pension rights as a temporary worker, you should be able to take them with you when you go back home. And we need a limitation on temporary worker status so that you don't become a temporary worker forever, a permanent temporary worker, because that bifurcates the labor market and reduces the rights that could be claimable by permanent workers. So those are some changes we propose. Another is, to the, is the introducing a category we call forced migrants, supplementing the category of refugees. We all know that the 1951 Convention is an immense landmark in human rights law. It provided for protection, that is asylum, if there is persecution, which requires a mens rea intent, on the grounds of race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. And it was a great landmark. Unfortunately, many of the people who are fleeing situations where their lives are at stake don't qualify, can't meet the standards of persecution for those specific elements I just mentioned. You know, many Syrians can't prove they're being persecuted. They're being killed and they're fleeing for their lives to survive, but they can't prove the persecution on those particular grounds. So we suggest a different, more encompassing standard of serious harm. I mean, anyone who is fleeing because they face an external threat to their life, whatever the cause might be. It might be a civil war that's not targeting them, but it's affecting their family. It could be drought. It could be flooding. It could be any particular cause. Organized criminal violence, such as occurs today, for example, in Honduras, would be an adequate cause. 
And remember, it was less than a year ago that Attorney General Sessions said that we were removing temporary protections for Central Americans because they didn't qualify under the 1951 convention. So we want to create a better floor level of protection. So anyone who's a forced migrant, who's fleeing directly from the situation that puts them at harm, then certified, those people will then have a claim on asylum in countries that they flee to. The last three points have to do with governance. The first is really inside the Beltway UNEs about how we organize a governing committee. And the key suggestion that we're making in this convention is that the new International Organization for Migration, newly a member of the broader UN system, be invited to co-chair a governance committee with UNHCR, bringing together migration and refugees creating a, a seamless interface between the two so that we have institutions that care about all, many, if not all, of the circumstances for which persons move across borders. The last two points on governance are also important to us. One we call the mobility visa clearinghouse that's described in the convention. And the idea there is that the, uh, those states that will someday choose to join this convention will create a web-based platform on which they will identify their likely labor demand for the next 10 years or so and make available visas that could be applied for by individuals, by recruiting firms, by national governments, so that we would get a larger number of safe, regular, and orderly pathways for the movement of people across borders. We have very high demand in the U.S. for immigrant labor but we don't have adequate legal pathways that, that can be realized. And that applies even a fortiori for many other countries. So this would increase the legalization pathways that would be available for migrant, for migrant uh, workers. That's very, very important to us. And to the skeptics who say, well, how do we know exactly how many workers, of what sort we'll need in the next two years? Your skepticism is, is, is well justified, but within rough orders of magnitude, we can estimate here in the U.S. the kinds of jobs that are not likely to be filled unless they're filled by, by immigrants. And they include things like agricultural labor, home care, many aspects of the medical profession, some silicon high-tech uh, uh, engineers. That's why the Silicon Tech Valley Companies are lobbying for them continuously. We can estimate those rough numbers and make those visas available on this kind of a platform, and so too could many other countries, improving the, the orderly quality of the movement of people across borders for employment. My last point gets to the problem that I mentioned of the 85% of the world's refugees now being cared for by developing countries. The Syrians, despite what we read, are, are not in Europe. Uh, the word refugee crisis was invented when the Syrians got to Europe. But previously, in much larger numbers, they're in southern Turkey, they're in Lebanon, and they're in Jordan. And that's an inequitable and unsustainable distribution of the responsibility to care for refugees. So what we propose is building somewhat on the uh, uh, on the Paris model, a movement from what uh, Peter Sutherland, the uh, former special re representative the Secretary General for Migration, used to call responsibility by proximity. And by that, of course, he meant the Jordan, Lebanon, and uh, Turkey who are caring for the Syrian refugees, to a new principle of responsibility by capability so that the countries that can best provide asylum uh, will be expected to do so. And so we propose a system wherein UNHCR would convene an, an annual meeting, and UNHCR would survey the, the, the need for asylum, that is how many refugees, how many forced migrants there were in the world, how much it was costing to sustain them, where they were, how many of them uh, needed to move for a variety of reasons. And it would basically create a budget. And then it would say, who has what nominal responsibility for these refugees and forced migrants. And borrowing at least initially the European formula, it would look at population, GDP, past unemployment, current refugee loads. 
And it's not very complicated to calculate out what would be the nominal responsibility of countries with that simple set of four pieces of data. And they can be calculated out. I've done so in a, in, with, with colleagues, and the numbers are not unreasonable. And this then would create a nominal responsibility for all countries. But we don't live in a world of world governments. There's no, there's no one who's, even the, if, if we in the UN, by the way, never did have black helicopters. We painted our, we painted our helicopters white, uh, and, they, and they don't enforce things. So it's all, we live in a world where sovereignty provides authority, which means that one has to work through voluntary commitment. What we rely upon here is that UNHCR having identified the need, countries then would be, who had signed this convention, would gather together and pledge what they were going to do. And then UNHCR would come in the next year and keep score. It would say, here was the global need, here were the pledges that were made, and here were the pledges that were kept. It relies for global governance on naming and shaming. Now, we know well it doesn't work well with shameless countries, okay? But we're hoping that there are enough shameful countries out there that this would somewhat improve the level of global responsibility sharing. When UNHCR issued a plea for assistance for the Middle East a few years ago, only 40% of its plea was met. And that was not adequate to provide reasonable uh, solidarity with Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan caring for Syrian refugees. So here's where I'd like to stop. Uh, please take a look at the handout. There is a web address down at the very bottom that will take you to the full convention. Uh, skim through it or read through it. Uh, please, if you find it a step forward, uh, join the others who have signed, the commissioners who negotiated it over a year and a half, and the signatories who have signed it. We think that the convention will get legs to the extent that it gets signatures. And so we're very hopeful that you will do so. You'll be in very good company. I, I spoke to this at a, a, with a group of wonderful students at the University of Sao Paulo uh, a year or so ago, and many of them signed. And at the other at political end of the spectrum, Ernesto Zedillo, uh, the former president of Mexico, uh, signed recently. And just two days ago, I got an email from a friend who is the mayor of Quito in Ecuador, and on behalf of the capital, the city, Quito, he signed this convention as well. So please join that company and provide some legs uh, to this effort, because someday, in the next 10 or so years, we hope that this will get the attention of the political leadership. It's not gonna resonate too well in Washington, or even for that matter in Berlin, Paris, London, or elsewhere today. The only two governments that have expressed an interest were Ecuador, not, not too surprisingly, if you know their record. And then I gave a talk on this basis on the same issue in Barcelona a year or so ago. I got a wonderful introduction by the deputy uh, commissioner for the Catalan region. And after our discussion, he said to me, an independent Catalonia will sign this convention. <laughs> It, it, it did not do me any good in Madrid, you could well imagine. But, so we know, we know that this is something that will take a long time, a lot of persuasion. Uh, it will be changed if it ever does get real diplomatic legs and enter the diplomatic negotiation sausage factory. Uh, but it's not, it's not totally pie in the sky. It's not totally utopian. This was the kind of process that started the landmines treaty. It was started by academics, NGOs, Amnesty International. After about 10 years, Lloyd Axworthy, the foreign minister of Canada, picked it up. He called a meeting in Ottawa and negotiated, drawing upon some ideas from Amnesty International and elsewhere, the Landmines Convention. Now again, the skeptics say, well, what's, what good is that if the US, China, and Russia are not parties to the convention? Well, there are other states that are parties. And moreover, I recently saw a paper by a graduate student indicating that it's affecting U.S. behavior on the deployment of mines as well, even though we're not a party to the convention. So we should be skeptics, but we should, and we shouldn't engage in pure utopia. Uh, but this is a hopefully, with political support, a realistic utopia that will allow some progress on these really important issues of the movement of people across borders, soup to nuts, everything from visitors and tourists all the way through those desperate people um, 
forced migrants and refugees who need a whole new home for themselves. Let me stop now and welcome your questions. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Con Conrad Harper. <laughs> Thank you very much. Conrad Harper, New York City. It was a very fine presentation on an immensely important and very difficult subject. And I'm glad you brought uh, to our attention the Landmines Convention. I would say just one word about it. While it is true the United States did not sign it, it was in fact heavily involved in some of the negotiations, and I think it's a better document for that reason. But let me ask you just a couple of very specific questions. Um, I take it no country has actually signed this in a political capacity. Is that correct? Correct. Do you have a sense as to the likely countries that may be first to do so? And my second question is, is there a provision in the convention that makes it effective upon the signature and ratification of a certain number of countries? And if so, mm -hmm. uh, how many? Good question. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, uh, Yes, uh, there are some countries that are more likely to be sympathetic to uh, this convention, uh, and there are others that are clearly not sympathetic. We don't have to look further than Washington to find a great deal of unsympathy. Uh, in many countries today, migration is used as a wedge political issue and designed to stir up some of our worst passions. But there are other countries who, for a variety of reasons, are more sympathetic to it. Ecuador has a long history, for example, of uh, welcoming uh, migrants into its country. You know, no, no country is saintly. You know, Ecuador wants to populate its eastern border, which is, which is unpopular, underpopulated. Uh, other countries, for example, have expressed sentiments that are much closer in this direction. Uh, I used to say that this was a convention written for Justin Trudeau. Uh, I would love to have Mr. Trudeau step forward and take the lead. He's had some difficulties recently, which will probably prevent him from doing so. But a number of other countries have, have created a coalition in favor of migration reform, and, but, and some for refugees too. They include Morocco, Bangladesh, for example. Uh, Sweden has been interested in this direction. Germany, at least while Angela Merkel uh, was interested in providing a, a better set of uh, rules for the movement of people across borders. Uh, and there are three or four other countries. The countries that are most sympathetic structurally are the ones that are both countries who are of emigration and immigration at the same time. Uh, that's, Mexico would fall under that particular list as well because they're concerned about providing protections for their citizens who bring back billions and hundreds of billions in remittances each year to their countries. And as a reciprocal matter, they're willing to enhance the protection of, of workers in their own country. So this is not totally pie in the sky, but we well realize this is not something that's going to happen soon. This is a 10 or 15 year horizon that uh, we are going to be uh, facing. With regard to numbers, you know, we would love to be put in the position of making those decisions, uh, but we're not going to be. This, this draft, despite all the care that we put into it, really is the roughest of possible drafts. If there's a couple foreign ministers who decide what to do next, it will be their strategizing, whether they would say, oh, this will come into force with the first 20 countries or will require it to go through the General Assembly. There are a number of different strategies on convention building that can be followed. And that's where you know, the diplomats will do their work and they'll assess what the shape of the international political climate is and to try to develop a strategy for that if we can inspire enough people to support the basic initiative. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Hamburger, Cambridge. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent one has to make a calculation as to whether the international dimensions of such an undertaking uh, in the current political climate um, effectively undermine some of its most laudable goals. Uh, in other words, to what extent is the perfect the enemy of the good? 
and how does one make a calculus uh, about such matters? In other words, uh, if one were to uh, attack these issues um, uh, without that larger framework which you have laid out, might one be able to make more progress? I ask it simply as a hypothetical question. Uh, to me, it's not. <clears throat> pardon me. To me, that's not hypothetical at all. It's a very real question. When we began this exercise, uh, we had co conversations. The members of the commission, Guy Goodwin Gill, Alex Alenikoff, many have deep ties with UNHCR, and so we spoke to UNHCR, the custodian of the 51 Agreement, and they said to us, "Please do not touch the 51 Agreement. Any effort to open it today will weaken it." rather than strengthen it. And they're right. Uh, there were discussions at that time in 2015, including from countries like Denmark, to significantly weaken the protections embodied in the 51 Convention of asylum and, and support. Um, and so we're well aware of that. When we came down to the final debates, and this, this was done by a commission through, in some cases, a majority voting, we decided that, look, this is not going to have any diplomatic tra traction right now. Let's take the effort that scholars should do to look over the horizon and try to create something that's going to be more coherent than the current international regimes. And so that's why we merge the category of refugees and forced migrants. And for us, the Convention refugees of 1951 are simply a subcategory of forced migrants all of whom would get the kind of protections that are even better than the ones included in the 51 Convention for Convention refugees. So there is real choices of that sort to, to make. We decided to say, let's push the, the, the horizon far out, and let's create a, a, a legally coherent framework of a, of a floor for protections for the movement of people across borders, knowing that the cost of doing so is that we are less immediately relevant to the, our time. There is good work going on under the Global Compact of Refugees led by UNHCR and the Global Compact on Migration, both of which are voluntary policy menus, which are moving the, the steps one by one. We decided to, to leave into the future, but aware of just the cost that you raised for us. Linda, Linda Greenhouse, New Haven. So, Assuming that not even signatory countries are going to just have an open door, they'll have some kind of process, mm -hmm. I wonder if the convention uh, offers some floor of adjudicative process, independence of the judges or the hearing officers from the political system and, and, and so on, some kind of best practice that countries can aspire to or, 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 or be judged by. Yes, no, exactly. That was one of our ambitions in two, in two directions. Excuse me. One, one, we set some minimum conditions, which many countries, but not all countries, follow, that the determination of your status, if you're applying for refugee status, for example, has to be made by a public official with, with a public record. Uh, that's very, very important to us. And then there are some standards uh, with regard to uh, we should follow the Convention of the Child, for example, with regard to any possible uh, holding of families. Uh, that's extremely important. It, shown, it should be the exception, not the rule. If it is done, it has to be continuously monitored and it has to meet all the standards of the Convention of the Child. So there are some floor level provisions that we include. We also have a process, a governance process, whereby the parties to the Convention uh, oversee the convention and take complaints that there are violations of it. Uh, they make determinations as to whether there's a violation or not. Uh, we haven't embodied sanctions in, in, the, in the convention, but there is, a, there is a provision that if a gross and egregious pattern of sanctions is identified, excuse me, of violations is identified, the committee that oversees this hypothetical treaty will refer that matter to the Security Council for potential enforcement if it rises to the level of crimes against humanity, war crimes, or other forms of violation. 
So that's our governance mechanism. Yes, please. Uh, Nicholas Sims Williams, Cambridge, UK. Um, you spoke of the signatory countries, supposing there ever are any, uh, coming together to uh, agree on a fair share, as it were, mm -hmm. of uh, the migrant work, uh, mi forced migrants and refugees they would take. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions about that. One is, what do you do about the problem that some countries are more attractive than others to refugees and others, and mm -hmm. people simply, some countries they just don't want to go to? because, for instance, they don't know the language and, and so on. Right. Uh, that's one question. The other question is, um, do you consider the possibility that the taking a fair share could, could involve uh, financial transactions as opposed to actual uh, movement of peoples? Yes. Thank, thank you. And thank, you, thank you for both of those questions. Uh, they're, they're both very much relevant. The idea is um, with regard to the pledges that are made by countries for their fair share. You can, countries can meet those pledges either by resettling refugees or forced migrants, taking them in, so or by writing a check that would provide for their, you know, care for a family of four, for example, if, if they were to stay in Lebanon, Syria, in Lebanon, Jordan, or Turkey. So those are the two alternatives. With regard to resettlement, Refugees are not going to be allocated in this system. There'll be places made available. They will apply for it. Uh, that's an important uh, choice mechanism that's at work. Uh, and moreover, in our labor mobility visa pool, we're going to reserve at least 10% of those visas that are made available to refugees or forced migrants who would like to be resettled to the countries, provided they meet the skilled criteria. That are, that are called for. So we attempt to address that. <clears throat> There's a question back in the back. Howard's next. Howard's next. Hi, Howard Gardner from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, the discussion has been very um, policy and legal oriented. Um, I'm thinking that this is going to require a much longer period of time mm -hmm. to get people to change the way they're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, inspired by the last session, I think how young people think about this is very important. And in that context, uh, our own group is involved with something called Out of Eden. Do you know about Out of Eden? No, oh, I'd, love, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Out of Eden is very, very quickly, Paul Salapak, a journalist, is walking around the world, retracing human beings, mm. uh, migration, which you know is becoming more and more understood now. It's supposed to take seven years. I think it's going to take 10. Mm. We have kids all over the world communicating about this. And it's a very different entry point, but maybe in the long run, it will be more effective than trying to get uh, you know, political leaders who are you know, protecting their derrieres. Just an idea. No, I think, I think it's a wonderful idea. You know, this, <clears throat> this is not going to happen if we rely upon current political leaders, obviously. It's only going to happen if political leaders get inspired by their self-interest and hopefully a change in culture. And that's what we're looking forward to. I think it's a wonderful initiative. You know, we all was 180,000 years ago, all came out of Africa, and that kind of a journey would express the, the nature of human beings. We are mobile in all sorts of different ways, and until we come to an understanding of that, we're not going to have politicians who will deliver for us the kinds of rules that will make for a more humane uh, scope for the global mobility of people. Back here. Um, Rosie. Rosie Abella from Canada. Um, just responding in part to what Linda Greenhouse raised, I think before you give up on judges, and I appreciate we're in the United <laughs> States, um, in the rest of the Western world, the judges on uh, the Supreme Courts are very um, decidedly eroding the wall between dualist and monist states. And so the requirement that a convention be signed is useful, but it's not a barrier to interpreting statutes and government action in a way that complies with the aspirational, which includes conventions which have not been signed, mm -hmm. which includes um, academic work. So the development of international law in some of our countries really is taking into account works like this whether or not they're actually signed. So I think, no, before you despair, don't give up on us. 
we're, we're there, we're listening, and I think the dissemination of this convention um, throughout the legal world is probably going to be as helpful as your political um, mm. movement towards getting encouragement from, uh, from governments. Thank you, thank you, for, <clears throat> thank you for that comment. Uh, <laughs> I might, as you say, I'm running out of voice, but let me just respond to that one. Uh, Louise Arbour is one of my heroes. She was most recently the special representative for migration and development for the UN, who led the process to produce the Marrakesh uh, Global Compact. And she, to my mind, uh, represents that kind of forward thinking uh, and is determined to see it move forward. She is basically our champion in, in this regard. Uh, she, she took a more limited agenda at Marrakesh because that's as much as she could get through the system. But in her own statements, she has said there's still a great deal to do, and she has not signed this convention yet. Uh, yet. Uh, I'm hoping she will, uh, but she herself realizes that we need a much more humane, <clears throat> humane and uh, a regular uh, world for the movement of uh, people across borders. And my, our, our colleague in this field, uh, James Hathaway, at the University of Michigan Law School, has been a leader of the view that one can reinterpret the 51 Convention in a much more progressive way, relying upon basic human rights law and um, international norms, which I wholeheartedly support. Uh, we still think that in the end, a convention will be useful, but it would be sad if we waited until this convention is signed and ratified before we uh, tried to make progress. We have one final question for you, and that's from Joel Cohen. Sure. Joel Cohen in New York City. Hi. Yes. Good to see you. Thank you for this very far-sighted work and for presenting it to us. Different countries have different definitions of who is a migrant. Some take 90 days, somebody, some take a year, some take intention. And at the moment, I don't believe there's international harmonization of the categories used in describing mobile people. Does the report address the need for a statistical infrastructure that could measure accurately what we're talking about <laughs> in this convention. And if it doesn't, what are your views on the need to get numbers that really mean something? Yes, <clears throat> we, we, create all these we create all of these categories, <clears throat> uh, but they don't, they don't take on sociological or social significance until we can begin to measure them. And I think that's very important. We don't specifically address it in the convention, but one of the good features of the Global Compact on Migration that Mrs. Arbour led, and also by Mexico and Switzerland in the negotiating process, is that it does identify the need for much better collection of data of the variety of circumstances under which people move across borders, where they come from, where they wind up, what consequences attach to that movement. And that's something that is extremely important if we're going to make uh, progress on the policy front. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I <laughs>